Uh, the short summary is we actually built a real test chip in 55 nanometer in the newest SMIC process. So let me set that up on, on what we did and what the market is. I think everybody kind of understands what the market is. There's all kinds of current designs. Um, I focus really on the microcontroller side. So you got the big guys building microcontrollers. And they need to add some additional features, right? Some of the hot things out there is voice recognition, facial detection, gesture detection. They're adding wireless capability. These things have to be integrated into these designs. So obviously, that's clearly the next step in IoT. And you see a lot of that already happening, right? Um, volumes are increasing, right? You just look at Amazon Echo and Google Home and all of these IoT at home applications. The volumes are really increasing. The next step is to do some cost reductions, right? Because clearly, to do some of those functions today, they're using processors that are, are, are way beyond what's really needed for the application. The power consumption, the costs are higher than that, what they ideally want. And so they really need to aggressively address costs. But they also need to keep in mind that they need to, to add these features and target the, the use cases that provide value. So um, that's really the challenge. And so the first question is, well, can a platform address this need? Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of IoT platforms. Almost all of these platforms focus on time to market, right? There's uh, others that obviously add flexibility to what you can do. Um, but time to market is one of the, the key things that they all provide. Um, but let's look at uh, some of the things that have happened in the past on companies that have successfully implemented platforms. And, and uh, the reason we looked at this is really just to kind of understand, OK, what kind of platform do we need? What kind of platform and collaboration will provide value to our customers? So you look back uh, at different industries, and back in 88, uh, the first disposable camera was uh, introduced by Nikon. So they had a year lead on Kodak. Uh, this was kind of an interesting story because uh, Kodak didn't have any type of um, solution. Um, they took some time to get what they felt was desirable out in a platform format. And what they were able to do with that platform is uh, quickly cater to sub-niches within the target audience um, very quickly. So they had, uh, in the matter of... Um, they, they released their camera a year after Nikon. Uh, they didn't have any market share. But after four years, because they started with a platform approach that they could quickly uh, target niches within the, the, the customer base, they actually um, uh, quickly captured 70% market share after four and a half years. So it, their success was related to the platform and the ability to cater to these niches. Uh, and this is just one example of, of what they were able to do. Um, the next thing was Ford. So now this is going back. Henry Ford is famous, of course, for the assembly process. But if you go back to his book written uh, called Modern Man, there's a whole chapter in there about subsystems. So not only does the, the automobile have a, a platform in which they build the entire assembly process on, they actually had subsystems within the vehicle that they went ahead and allowed third parties to innovate on. They took these subsystems, they optimized them for the specific functions they were, but they were all also able to pull those out and put other subsystems in to, again, cater to their specific niches. So um, this type of flexibility, this type of platform, this type of uh, subsystem within the platform allowed a lot of innovation uh, to address the, the market. And this is from uh, data from a business case uh, out of uh, Sloan Business um, a school from MIT, and they gained about 5.1% market share per year because they were able to focus on some of the comforts, ease of use, use, and durability of those components and subsystems within the vehicle. The same thing was done with the commercial aviation. So um, like IoT, uh, commercial aviation started at some point where it was really based upon the DC-1 platform. The engineers that designed that purposely designed it so that things could be pulled out and put in very quickly and easily uh, to address different aircraft that had to do um, troop movements or equipment movements. And then uh, the DC-3 morphed into a commercial aviation. So you actually spurred entire new industries um, in a very um, uh, new uh, technology in, in the airplane. Um, and then, of course, uh, so all of those three successes were based on platforms. More so, they actually had the specific subsystems that were flexible, uh, that allowed innovation to cater to the specific uh, use cases for the customers. So this is what was really important in the platforms. Um, and then, of course, owning these platforms from um, uh, throughout the supply chain was really valuable. Of course, back in 2008, everybody said, 
oh, Apple can't do it with their own silicon. Um, they'll quickly fall behind in technology. And, of course, they've proved everybody that they can capture market share and uh, be very successful with the model on developing their own SOCs. Um, and I guess the, the final thing to mention here uh, that kind of comes for full circle is the fact that uh, ASIC design doesn't necessarily have to be a rich man's game. There's plenty of articles out there, specifically in IoT. Uh, you can uh, develop these ASICs relatively inexpensively, and, and this is just one example of an article. So with that, I'll get into what actually we did with SMIC and uh, Bright. Um, so Bright is a design service uh, services company. Uh, SMIC, of course, is a foundry, and they have introduced their, their newest uh, 55 nanometer um, process with embedded flash. So this is, in tar this is targeting IoT type applications, uh, specifically microcontroller type applications. Um, so it can be anything from metering to medical to uh, all kinds of consumer uh, wearables. Um, and uh, what we did is we actually integrated um, Synopsys DesignWare Arc Data Fusion subsystem within a chipset. We also integrated some IP from Synopsys like our i3C, which is uh, based out of the MIPI organization. So it's basically the follow-on to I squared C. Um, it's, it's taking the best of I squared C and SPY and morphing that into a, a, a new standard called I3C. We have that on this chipset, um, as well as a, a combination of, of USB um, from the, the PHY from um, Bright and the USB controller from Synopsys. Um, so the idea here is that we have a complete uh, demonstration platform uh, that includes very applicable um, demos with respect to the hot applications within IoT. So we have a voice activation control using Sensory's um, truly hands-free software. So Sensory is a very well-known um, voice recognition um, software provider, and we've worked with them to um, pull that capability into the demo. Uh, this demo is actually over at the SMIC booth, and so I actually encourage everybody to take a look at that. It's a really slick demo. Um, basically, uh, what the voice activation is doing is that it's turning on music from a speaker connected via Bluetooth. It's moving to the next song. It's going back to the, the previous song or turning off. Um, that same demo actually has a 90 sensor fusion um, algorithm in that uh, um, chipset running on the, 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 the uh, design itself using Hillcrest Labs motion engine software. Um, and of course, Hillcrest Labs is one of the leaders out there in the market. Um, we also have a facial detection and gesture control interface. So not only can you control the playing of music via your voice, but you can also do it via voice dete or facial detection to move to the next song or to turn off the music or turn on the music. But you also can do gesture recognition. So because we have the sensors on there, you can do specific gesture recognitions to go ahead and move to the next song uh, and, and move back. So basically what this platform does is we have a complete uh, design database uh, based on this uh, chipset. It's a, a real design. Um, it's not just uh, vaporware. It's based on the newest SMIC 55 ULP uh, process. Uh, that operates down to 0.9 volts. So a lot of these systems today are developed in 90 nanometer. Um, so the minimum voltage is about 1.6 to 1.8 volts. Going down to 0.9 volts is extremely uh, beneficial from a power standpoint for dynamic power, especially for always on functions that you see here. Um, and then Bright ended up doing all the SOC integration. And of course, Synopsys was uh, responsible for um, the many of the IP components as well as um, putting the end applications and demos together with our software teams. So basically we have a, a full um, uh, uh, value chain here uh, to accelerate MCU design, but it's not just to accelerate it. It's based on the subsystem concept. It's also based on uh, ex expediting time to market. So these are some of the components. So our data fusion subsystem IP from Synopsys is based on an ARC processor. Um, so one thing that you can do with our processor that's very differentiated is we're able to tightly couple these peripherals and, and uh, uh, such as I squared or I2C and SPIES and UARTs and PWMs. Uh, the other piece that is differentiated about ARC is that we can go ahead and create custom instructions. So these custom instructions are hardware accelerators for specific functions. So on the 9D sensor fusion, for instance, we actually did some custom instructions to address uh, trigonomic functions. So those trigonomic functions uh, will reduce the number of cycles. 
um, therefore lowering the overall power uh, required to operate the, the um, application. We also have tightly cut, we can tightly couple the interface to the data converter. So a lot of sensors come in through the analog to data uh, converter, and so we have a tightly coupled interface on that. Um, and of course, it's completely configurable. So again, it's not just a subsystem. It's flexible for customers to innovate based on their designs. Uh, we also include our USB on-the-go controller, along with Bright's Phi. Um, we've included our uh, an SDIO, and I mentioned the i3C. This is one of the, the first designs that actually includes i3C. Um, of course, there's, there's a couple others out there already, but um, uh, this is a brand new IP. It's brand new out there on the market today. Um, and again, this is built based on the, the SMIC 55 UOP process with embedded flash uh, from SMIC. So it's, it's a, a basically a microcontroller design. So here's a little bit of detail on the uh, SMIC 55 ULP process. Of course, it supports all the core devices. It has a new ULL uh, SRAM bit cell to lower the overall power consumption and leakage. Um, uh, complete library and memory compilers down to 0.9 or 1.2 uh, time volt timing models. We also have the I.O. devices uh, for overdrive at 2. Point, uh, or 3.3 volts or underdrive at 1.8 volts. Um, you can integrate RF. Uh, of course, I talked about the embedded flash and, of course, analog uh, IP capabilities. So here's some preliminary numbers on the process itself versus the 55LL at 1.2. So you can see there's a big difference on operating at 0.9 volts. Of course, there is a, a penalty on performance sometimes. Um, these, again, are preliminary numbers. But, of course, this is great for a lot of uh, new applications uh, in the smart home or any type of IoT um, market. So Bright is a, a design service company. Um, they provide complete spec to final chip. Um, they have uh, basically an innovative uh, MCU database now that they can go ahead and quickly configure and change based on the application needed. Um, now they have full experience using the Arc CPU, the low power analog IP, um, and uh, chip integration verification. Um, of course, that provides uh, time to market advantages, and, and what they provide is the complete turnkey services. So this is actually a block diagram of the device itself. So up in purple is actually a diagram of the uh, subsystem itself. So we've tightly coupled many of the peripherals. You see GPIO and I squared C. Um, we have the DSP capabilities on this device uh, and a couple custom instructions to handle some specific applications. Um, beyond that, um, I mentioned the I3C, PWMs, SDIO, and the USB. Um, Power consumption is a big deal, so we supported eight power domains on this with dynamic voltage and frequency scaling support and two main operating modes. Um, so we're operating at 150 megahertz at 1.2 volts and uh, 72 megahertz at 0.9 volts. So here's um, a little some numbers that we have uh, from a uh, of our data fusion subsystem versus a typical infrastructure that you'll see on most microcontrollers today. Most of them have a 32-bit CPU with an AHB bus, uh, connections to your, your memories, as well as a bridge to your APB bus and some of your peripherals. What, again, what you're able to do and what's differentiated about this subsystem and the ARC processor is that you can tightly couple all those peripherals, therefore removing all these buses from the system. That actually reduces your overall die size. Um, beyond that, uh, you reduce your cycle count because it's tightly coupled and lower your overall power for your uh, application. And then uh, finally, you can add the Apex hardware accelerators like we did for the 9D sensor fusion. Um, we didn't have to do it for the voice, but really you can do that for encryption. You can do it for all kinds of different algorithms. And we have um, some specific uh, uh, offerings that, that come uh, right out of the box. So you can see some of the uh, advantage of that. This is representative of a sensor fusion application in 90 nanometer. So we've gone beyond just the ability to build your own. We actually offer this as a product. So you can buy this out of, off the shelf as a product, as a subsystem. Um, and this is kind of the basis for most microcontrollers. Um, it includes the DSP performance for always on IoT, including the voice, audio, and facial detection. And again, the demo's over at the SMIC booth. I encourage everybody to go and take a look at that. So here's a little bit more on I3C. So Basically, I3C was developed out of the MIPI organization um, because your cell phone has anywhere from 12 to 15 sensors anymore today. 
And so doing that with I squared C and SPY um, really is not uh, optimal, right? So uh, what you, what's great about I2C is that it's a two-wire interface, but sometimes it, it doesn't support enough sensors, and sometimes it's not fast enough. The thing about SPY is that it's low power, and it, its speed can actually get a little bit higher than most serial protocols. Um, I3C leverages the benefits of both of these, and you can see clearly with this picture how many just pads you're going to save by designing with I3C versus your SPY and I2C squared that you have today in your systems. Of course, it also supplies up to uh, uh, higher speeds, so you can see the different options here in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and uh, as people start adopting it, we suspect that we'll get to higher and higher speeds. Um, most implementations today are in the uh, 11 to 22 megabits per second. Of course, Synopsys is famous for its uh, USB uh, device controllers. We've had billions of these shipped. Um, very small gate count. In fact, uh, a couple years ago, um, to address IoT, we took the conscious effort to uh, reinvest and, and re-architect many of this, this IP to address the IoT space. Um, so this is actually a result of that. Um, we went back to uh, nodes such as 40 and 55 nanometer, where most of the teams were working on 28 and below, and we decided to optimize the die size and optimize for power consumption. So this is a result of this. We do provide native drivers uh, support in Linux um, uh, with the IP. Um, on the implementation with the demo kit that we have today, we did a, a simple SDIO uh, to connect to other peripherals. Uh, but we do have a, a full, uh, sol complete solution of, of host IP, um, anywhere from, from SDIO, SD, and EMMC, even some of the latest standards that include inline encryption. Um, and uh, um, this is part of the, the demo. And this is uh, I2S, of course, that's used for the audio functions. Uh, the reason I included this is that we continue to innovate. So the subsystem that you see today um, has I squared S included in this. Our future one and latest rev actually includes I3C as well. So we've actually tightly coupled that to the subsystem itself. Again, reducing cycle count, reducing die size, and the, and the need for the AHB bus. So I guess with that, the, the value of the demo kit is basically we have all the pieces starting from uh, design service, the, the foundry, the IP, and the design services in place. Um, th we have uh, complete uh, available demos on voice activation, 9D sensor fusion, and facial and gesture detection. Uh, of course, there's cost savings and time to market savings that come along with any um, platform, um, as well as die size savings with uh, Synopsys IP. But the real thing here is the ability to innovate and enable our customers to differentiate their program or their platforms. Uh, and we put some numbers here on uh, lower dynamic power and leakage power, uh, a full turnkey service from spec to final chip, and then, of course, um, the reduction in energy by leveraging these specific subsystems that can be catered for very specific applications. So I guess with that, I'd like to say thank you guys for attending.